uh, introduce yourself and uh, then we can go from there. Yeah, my name is Henry Perro. I'm the owner and operator of Perro's Gun Shop and Police Supplies in Waterbury, Vermont. And I, from there, Henry, uh, I guess right now, and somebody else may have some other questions, but interested in uh, basically how it works when somebody uh, comes up, comes into your shop and, and buys a gun and maybe get into uh, the, you know, the, the three-day waiting period type thing and um, different steps that may or may not happen through, through, the, through that time. Yeah. Well, the first thing when a customer comes in, they must be positively identified, and most uh, easiest way is a Vermont photo driver's license in which we verify that it is the person in the picture we verify that that is who is coming in to purchase the firearm so from there they fill out a form called 4473 and they answer a series of questions a little further uh, into the identification process social security number height weight and then from there we do what we call a federal background check on that person it's conducted by the FBI. What we do is we take that information that has been supplied to us and we transfer it to the FBI computer. And what happens is there's three typical responses. There's a proceed, there's a deny, and then there's, or it could be a delay. So a proceed is obviously they can purchase the firearm, the deny, means no. Uh, the denied file, I went to a seminar by the ATF, and they have a separate computer with millions of names in it that are known felons, bad people who should not have a firearm. And it's pretty much instant. When you hit it, it will come back denied, because that's the first computer system that it searches. If not, then it will go into the next system and look a little deeper. If there's a hiccup, if you will, and a hiccup is pretty vague. A hiccup can be a common name. Last I knew there was approximately 50,000 John Smiths in the United States. So out of that 50,000 John Smiths, I'm sure there's some bad ones, probably convicted felons, uh, people who should not own a firearm. So what it does, it puts it into a three day, three business day status. It doesn't count that day. So if I did one today and came back delayed, tomorrow is the start of the three business days. So you have three full business days, weekends, holidays, they don't count. The other issue. So, oops, yeah, so, so if somebody came in on a Monday, uh, they wouldn't be, so they wouldn't be approved for four days. For four days, really. Right. Because it's three complete business days. Right. And then we can deliver the firearm on the fourth day. And it's all documented through the computer when that firearm can be delivered. Right. And this is all according to the FBI. It's not something we make up. Uh, another reason people get put on a delay status, other than common name, is if they have a top secret clearance in the military. I, I've tried to inquire why. And the best answer I can get is, because when they do the background check, it shows that an in-depth background check has been done. But it doesn't show why. So it takes a little bit of time to figure out it was because they applied for top secret clearance. So those are the three biggest. Or the other reason is they can have a restraining order. Uh, there's other reasons. But the, the bottom line is it's a three-day delay to do a further research. So, so those ones that, that were uh, delayed, yeah. and it's because of the in-depth uh, check, uh, they do eventually get approved. Yes, I would have to say yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, for whatever reason, it can go beyond the three business oh, yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, it just takes But longer. for the most part, I believe the last statistics, the three day is, is cleared up 97, 98% of the time mm -hmm. within those three <coughs> business days. And, and they'll come back with a yes or a no within those three days. 
and we're, we're, we are required by law to go back into the computer system. So if you were put on delay and there was no response and you came in on the fourth day, we still have to take that one extra step and go back into the computer system to verify any additional information which may have come forward. Mm -hmm. Martin? Yeah, a couple questions. So have you run into a situation where uh, an individual's delayed uh, because on their, maybe you don't know what the delay is, but because they have a misdemeanor assault charge and there's some time that needs to be spent to figure out if that's related to domestic violence. I do understand that that's one of the other kind of big yeah, sure. area where you might have delay, but I wonder if you personally have. Well, or, or yes, because I also have experience in the law enforcement field uh, for the city of South Burlington. Right. So uh, what will happen sometimes is if they do have an assault charge, simple assault, what they need, the state police, I think I think what happens is the, the FBI will contact the Vermont State Police and they'll pull the record to find out if it was, uh, you got a scuffle over a football game with one of your buddies who'd been drinking, being a simple assault, or if it was a simple assault on a family member that would be part of the domestic violence. So back in the old days, it was simple assault. It was simple assault, but they really break it down. Right. Even go do they back. still do that? Is my understanding that it's still not broken down? Mm. I believe it is now broken down. I believe. I wouldn't swear to it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to double check that. Mm. So the other thing is, uh, have you been in a situation where uh, somebody after the three days has been determined to be a prohibited person? Uh, do you get involved in that at all? Are you notified that, yeah, this, you did, well, I assume that the first question, once they figure this out, is did you turn over the firearm after the three days? Yes. So let's say at like a 10th ten, day they figure out, oh, this person should have been denied. Yeah. So, yes, I have been involved in a couple of those. So after the three business days, we can deliver on the fourth day. They have to go back in a test, they have to sign under penalties of perjury, the answers are still correct. And then we can deliver the firearm. We have to re-identify them in certain sure. procedural. So, and then we have had not very many, a couple, three, four, where the ATF will call and say they're calling on the status of John Smith, date of birth, we pulled the paperwork and said, yes, we did deliver the firearm on this date. So what typically happens, they send a local ATF agent in, they get the paperwork, and they go and they take the firearm away, and or they charge them also, because it was uh, it's perjury if you lie on that form. And it's pretty simple the way the forms are set up with fingerprints and palm prints and signatures and identification to have good evidence. So there's been a couple cases where the ATF has called me. They did a follow-up to see if I delivered the firearm, and I did. And within a few hours, the ATF agent will come in, pull the original form, see what we can remember, if we could identify the person, you know, typical crime scene investigation, because it is a crime and then they will go after that person. And then it kind of, I lose contact because they can't tell me anything. Sure, sure, that makes sense. So, so through the years you've had two, three, four of those? I would probably and, say four, okay. just guessing. Uh, um, I, you can probably tell me pretty close how many years, but probably not how many gun sales. <laughs> uh, well, of course Vermont went to the the record keeping, the Brady checks, and the backgrounds in 94, 95. Uh, so I would say from that period, I've been in business 38 years, but it didn't happen in the beginning. Right. Because the records weren't computerized. So lately, and the same the last 10 years to be safe, and benefit of the doubt, I'll say maybe four. Selena? You Barbara, know what, my question got answered through Martin's line of questions. Okay. So we've got a lot to, a lot to take. <laughs> so 
I'm wondering the times that it's come back no. Um, it comes back no a lot more than a perceived, and then when they go back. So, 5% of the time. Okay. It, it's, like, it's a low number. Okay. It's a low number. And you hear that right away too, you say? It's, yeah, it's pretty much instant. And then you have to communicate that to the person. Yes. How does that go? Um, <clears throat> a lot of times, they, they try to get into, well, why? Right. And I go, well, they don't tell us. Okay. So because of my law enforcement background, I can talk to them. I say, you don't have to tell me anything. Right. But did you ever have a restraining order? Did you ever get in a motor vehicle crash where there was serious bodily injury? You know, and I try to, it, it, I did have one guy who goes, yeah, I was in a, I was a kid in college, and I got in a serious crash, and some people got hurt. I said, well, that could be a felony, depending on a lot of circumstances. So they go, oh. So what I do is I try to send them down to State Police Headquarters, BCIC, and then they can get a record on themselves. Right. But people don't get angry with you about it. Not really. The people, there's two classes of people. People like the college kid who maybe got into a car crash 20 years ago and injured someone. Yeah. Didn't really think that, about that as being a felony. And then there's people who come in who, who kind of hoping the system would fail them and they'd be able to leave with a fire. <laughs> and I, I remember when we heard about, when we were taking um, testimony about a gun bill a few years ago, um, there was a witness who talked about his brother being very suicidal and going and getting the gun. I mean, obviously he wasn't on a list. Are there ever times that you have sort of questioned if someone's not on the list but they're obviously distraught and what like how much leeway do you have in these kinds of Well we have a thing called dealer denied. And I have used it. Uh, and I have instructed my employees that when the hair stands up on the back of your neck, there's something out of place and I'm not around, they go on dealer denied, which are uh, dealer uh, a holding pattern, you know, delay, dealer right. delay. And we blame it on the federal government. Oh, geez, you, you got put on delay. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, we got to blame the federal government. Right. Yeah, sure. right. You know, so we right. kind of blame them. Just take the heat off us. Mm -hmm. And I have turned certain things over to law enforcement. Right. Uh, straw purchases. There's certain things you look for. And I'll contact the chief in that hometown and they go, oh my god, yeah, we've been kind of looking for them. And you said straw purchase? It's a straw purchase. Okay. Yeah, a straw purchase is, say, I'm a convicted felon and I come in with my girlfriend and I'm kind of looking and going, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, that's a nice one there, but you don't really touch it. And then, so the girlfriend comes over and goes, hey, I'd like to buy this. A Pearl Street beverage thing. <laughs> What's that? There are people that go in into Pearl Street Beverage and purchase. Yeah. So there is a it's a straw purchase. And if we get any information, <clears throat> anything like that, we click on dealer delay until we can contact. And we've been very successful in preventing straw purchases. Then uh, a, a young gentleman came in and I, I know the family and he was trying to purchase a firearm, he didn't quite know what he wanted. It, there was all these indicators that you pick up on. It just doesn't seem right. I put him on delay, called the family, and it was, oh my God, and they came right down. And I said, now the problem is, I know you, I know the family, uh, you know, so we gotta do something. So they called him back in and talked to him, and they got him the help, and he's, you know, reliable. Sounds like your law enforcement background is really helpful. It is, but it's also, yeah, the liability nowadays with just about anything you do. Uh, you know, you're, you'd be so quick to be sued over anything mm -hmm. that not just me, but any, I'm friends with all the gun dealers in Vermont. Uh, they don't want to take the chance of, so my rule is, you know, exercise on the rule of caution. You know, just, 
if if something's out of place, just click dealer delay, blame it on the government, see what happens. So it does happen. Is there any training for somebody that's newly opening up a gun shop? Because it sounds like you've got some really wise advice. So yeah, there's um, there's some courses, National Shooting Sports Foundation. Some of these other groups will will help guide you through. I'm in the process of uh, trying to take the next step and open an indoor shooting range, mm -hmm. which is a new venture for Vermont. And I need, my staff needs training and guidance. And those are the folks that are kind of helping. Well, and then Martin. Next. So uh, how often would you say you have a sale that goes the uh, through the three days and you haven't gotten back a, a yay or an A on the background check? Very few. Um, I think that's what I was referring to when I said about four. Oh, okay. So after that three day, you can deliver. And right. I think it's probably been about four in ten years. The just after the after the three day period, yes. you could make the decision whether or not to sell because you hadn't heard back. Yes. So, so do they get back to you if they figure out that no, this person was fine? You know, they they send you the unique. Yeah, they do identification yeah. number. Right. Well, we get a transaction number, almost like credit card approval, instantly. Transaction. And it ties everything together, that transaction. Oh. So they will call, they can call 30 days and say, hey, reference transaction number, uh, did you deliver the firearm? Yes. On what day? And that's when they'll come pull the actual paperwork. But, but uh, do they get back to you if they have determined that the person was not a prohibited person? Do they get back to you and say, yeah, that one was fine? They have, but it's not the same as if they're not. Sure. sure. It's not a priority to say they're not. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, no, you wouldn't think that they would. At all yeah. That was. So, but they do once in a while. Okay. They do. So just a couple other questions. Do, um, do you have many sales that involve somebody having the unique personal identification number under the volunteer, voluntary appeal file? It's, it's a, I don't know, I think, when you were a couple years ago, we may have talked about this a little bit as well, that there's this process that if you've been denied before bec or you've been delayed because of your name and you want to streamline getting your future firearms, that you can go through this process that probably, I don't know how involved it is. Uh, but are you familiar yeah, with that? Yeah, so it is quite a process. Uh, you have to be fingerprinted. Right. There's a whole, it's an appeal process. It's some of the people I know have hired attorneys. My brother-in-law got caught up. His name is um, William Mallon. Not really a common name, but apparently there's one serving time for murder in California. And then he died while he was in prison. Somehow, all of a sudden, he, and he had purchased quite a few firearms. We go through the same background check. All of a sudden, he got denied. Couldn't figure out why. So he had to go through the appeal process. <coughs> Maybe photographed, but I don't. I don't know that for sure. But definitely fingerprinted, right. copies of your driver's license, birth certificate. You know, all kinds of documentation. You have to send it to the government. It takes about six months, and then if you're cleared, if you're not the person that is dead in California, <clears throat> then what they have is what they call a U PIN. It's a unique personal identification number, uh, and then you put that in when you fill out the form. And then we put it in the background check, so it kind of goes right to that, the correct person. Right to that file that has the U pins. Um, so you still check, obviously, the ID and that, you know, they don't just present the number. Oh, yeah, no, result. definitely. Right, right, right. Yeah, because, okay. you know, if somebody found somebody's wallet and it had U pin number on right, it, right, right, you right. wouldn't allow them to come in by gun. So right. you could still have to go through the exact same process, one extra step. So there's there's no special consideration for relatives then. No. <laughs> well, no. Um, I mean, you know, we have um, high-ranking military officials yeah. that get put on. We have police officers. We have. I had a chief of police in uniform one day get denied. <laughs> it it happens, and then you have to fight to have your rights restored, even though. It's not your mistake. It's the government made a mistake, and they, they take your rights away. 
but here he is in full uniform carrying a firearm. <laughs> yeah. But yet he couldn't buy one, and he had to go through that whole new pin problem, right. that process. Yep. So, um, hypothetical, three days goes by, you, you uh, sell the firearm, transfer it, whatever the terminology is. Uh, turns out this person should not have a firearm. It's, it's the feds that are going to investigate that from there. Yes. And how quick do they get on that? I hate well, I hate to give a real time frame because it doesn't happen a lot. Right. Uh, I would say within 24 hours they're on it. Yeah. So it could have already been a week or two, and then they finally get the response back. Right. And I say, so probably within 24 hours they're they have one of the local agents out of Burlington yeah. uh, investigating. Okay. So that's uh, within 24 hours of you getting notification that they they're not supposed to. Yeah. Have the firearm, and internally maybe it's even quicker. I don't right. know. Right. Maybe I'm the last chain that gets notified. I don't know that. Oh, so, so you would be notified to notify the FBI. Then the, they would have. Yeah, the ATF would take care of all these. So that that, that happens. Um, they're notified before you are. I don't know what. Oh, okay. Is. Okay. Well, maybe maybe I am notified first because the first question: Did you deliver the firearm? Right. If I say oh. no, well, end of story. Yeah. Um, but if I do say yes, then it's a it's a priority. Okay. But even if I do say no, the ATF agent comes gets the form because that means that person lied on the form. Yeah. So they will they will look at the form. They'll do a, look at why he was denied. And he did six armed robberies in Springfield, Mass. Well, he's a bad guy. Shouldn't have a gun. Yeah. Then they will go after that person for perjury, lying on that form. Do you know the penalties around that? Pardon? Do you know the penalties around that? Uh, I, I really that, don't. Just, it's a federal law. Right. Martin? So what happens with the individuals that are immediately denied that they have filled out this form and presumably could have perjured themselves? The local agent gets a copy of that form. They're notified. Right. My understanding is that whenever a Vermont gun dealer gets a denial, right. it shoots it to the Burlington office. That's where I believe all the agents are housed out of Burlington. ATF? Agent? ATF. Right. So there's an agent that's in charge of denials. So we'll come across. And then, you know, because you hear how hard work the federal prosecutors are, they don't have time to do anything. Right. What the agents will do is they screen it. Why was this guy denied? Did he lie on the form? Well, we go back to the kid that was in college that hurt somebody 20 years ago. And he's has a clean record every since. <clears throat> Are they going to prosecute him? No. Are they going to talk to him? They might give him a phone call, hey, just to let you know you shouldn't be trying to buy any more guns. You know, and then maybe they'll even say you should get a record from the state police, just that way you know what you're looking at. Uh, the guy that robbed 7 Elevens in Springfield, Mass, they're going to say, hmm. And they may, may not go right after him, but they'll use it. They have it now. So they'd either contact him, do something with it, or maybe he's an in, uh, being investigated in another case and they use it. You know, there's a lot of what ifs. Mm -hmm. But they do do something with them. They don't just sweep them under the carpet. So <clears throat> I have a tangential question, uh, not really about this bill. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, how, how, how often are you getting individuals who are coming in for a private sale to have you do the check on the, on the backgrounds on the NIC system? We might average one a week. Okay. So the service is available though, people do get to come in and... <coughs> we do offer yeah. the service. Yeah. yeah. About one week? Okay. Interesting. Harbor? So it sounds like you've been in the business a while, you're a law enforcement trained. Are there laws that you think would make it easier for you to do your job and not be selling them to the people that you know, or not just you, but other gun deal? Like, is there anything that you see as something that would be helpful? Well, when you said to sell firearms to people I know, that's... 
that's where you get into being subjective. And we can't do that. We have to go by the federal right. yes or no system. And then system. other sellers, not other, not knowing the buyer. Like, are there are there either glitches in the system or things that would make it easier to just like you're like, hey, it's the facts. Like, are there things that if we put in place, it would take some heat off of you that the state could sort of own? Mm -hmm. Well, when I testified last year, you know, I said one of the biggest things I would support, and I think every gun dealer in Vermont would support, and I would help to get you there, is to skew everything toward the criminal and not the law-abiding citizen. When you have a convicted felon, when you have somebody, right. yeah, go after that person yeah. as a deterrent these laws that are being proposed, they only apply to law-abiding citizens. And that just hinders my job, it hinders everything. It's just, it... So how would is, you see it play out then? What would that look like? Going after the criminals and And not the others, right, like how... How do I see it? <laughs> well, I, we would need to fund the ATF or maybe the State Police Task Force with an ATF task force, and they go after these people who are bad people that shouldn't have a firearm. I don't think anybody in Vermont would complain about that. The people that are complaining are law-abiding citizens that, you know, the rights are being chipped away. And what about the person that, that's on a, like, <clears throat> relief from abuse, like, they um, have a relief from abuse order, or they may not be sort of listed as somebody who's robbing 7-Elevens yeah. or the really distraught person that you kind of... So my understanding is that the sheriffs are the holders of the restraining orders and that they have to report those to the federal government. So they are in the system. That's my understanding. So somebody, I do a background check on you and you're from Washington County and Sam Hill has reported that there's a restraining order against you. And did we hear Friday that actually they go to BCIC? They, they, just identify yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Chris Herrick, Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. And for the record, I purchased weapons from Henry Hill. Um, the holding stations is a bit of a different issue, and I don't know how detailed we want to get. But um, probably not too deep because yeah. we have to have Eric on our, on our next. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> no, um, we're going to have you back talking about. Yeah, we can yeah. do that. However, yeah. the essence of what you said is correct. It's entered into um, the uh, NCIC database. Thank you. So, can I just ask one thing? Yeah. So this six months, that if you have an identical name or whatever that pops up in this system. It takes six months or more for that person to get cleared. The person that's, lack of a better word, innocent, doesn't have a problem uh, before that person can purchase a firearm. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the person may have a, a similar name, date of birth, whatever, with criminal history. Yeah. Most of the time, 95, 98% is cleared up within the three business working days of the federal government. Okay. It's that one time that it's got to go beyond. And it, then what happens is if John Smith, date of birth, whatever, is a good guy, he's a police officer, uh, he would apply for what they call a U-pin. It's, it's almost like a TSA pre-check, if you will, okay. where they kind of pre-screen you. Yep. And what they do is they give you an authorization number. And then when you come back into the shop, you fill out Smith, John, Earl, date of birth. But then there's a block, you pin. And then you take your old wallet out and you type in your, your number. You fill in your number. When that form, we transmit it to the federal government, we put that you pin number in. And what it does, it because a, a more in-depth background check has been done on you, they've identified you with fingerprints. You identified yourself with a photo driver's license to me. Everything matches. It pushes you through the system. Thank you. Great. 
So, so that process the, to get a U pin, um, it's all, it's an appeal. It can be an appeal process if you in are have been denied, right? That that you're kind of yes. That or it could be a process that it seems like every time you go, it takes three days. I mean, you, you can you can you can get a U pin without having been denied necessarily if you just want to expedite the process because you have a common name. I you don't can, believe so. I now I could be wrong. Okay. Uh -huh. But I don't believe that is why it was set up. Because it would what would happen is I think it would probably overburden the government with people who just want to streamline the system. Right. So I think it was set up. And I should have brought a folder with me but I didn't there's rules and regulations about it. Uh, you could be right, but I don't think it was set up for that. I think it was set up for this long delay process where you've been denied. I don't think you can on a delay. I think it's denied. Okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, committee, we're going to stay on the record and uh, have Eric. Uh, Thanks Jump into the witness seat and uh, we'll get right on 579. Doctor? Let's go on 31 pages. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 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 And if we could let Eric uh, go through the bill and hold our questions to the end, because we're uh, we're actually on schedule to get done at, at uh, four twenty. Uh, we we'll go a couple minutes over. It's chance to ask, you know, like during the proceeding, but I asked him, you know, like, do some people get stalled because of multiple background checks? And he says they do. He said it's almost like a credit check. You know, if, if oh, you, the more you get. Right. The, yeah. more, the more card you apply for, the more you get or whatever, yeah. that will affect your score. Huh. So, like, if you work for two or three different school districts, and each school district says they want to do a background check, and you go to buy a gun, and they go. <laughs> and it's entirely different. But, you know, interesting. Yeah. Anytime you're ready, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Eric <coughs> Patrick here again with Ledge Council to talk about H579. Um, I think one of I was hoping for another document. I don't think it, I think it made it through. Honestly, sent Mike something that didn't make it up here, so it's going to make it a little harder to do this. Um, so, um, I where I can get that. Um, yeah, uh, computer. I'm not sure I can pull my email on this iPad. So, I'll just. Uh, well, we can look at the document itself another time. I'll just turn. I'll just. Uh, through real quick if I could. Um, so, you remember we were talking this morning about a general reclassification system, right? Mm -hmm. This whole, to put the criminal offenses into A, B, C, D, and E for felonies and misdemeanors, that kind of thing, all based on the, the uh, essentially the punishment that's involved in the offense, right? How long is the imprisonment or the amount of the fine? So, we were also talking about how, well, 
there's still the the sentencing commission still have the authority to go through the sort of list of all the different criminal offenses and think about well how do we want to maybe address certain groups of offenses differently because you can still make specific decisions about how how sentences should be set up for for particular uh, types of offenses so it did that for a couple different types including property offenses and that's what we're looking at right now when we say property offenses you know it could be theft for example embezzlement fraud um, uh, bad ch passing bad checks, any any offense that involves taking money or taking property, that sort of thing. And the way um, the statutes are set up now, uh, they're frequently the the offense, uh, the punishment, I should say, turns on how much money is involved in the offense. So, if I steal five hundred dollars, the punishment will not be as severe as if I steal ten thousand dollars, right? So. An odd feature of the current uh, <coughs> criminal code is that many times, not always, but many times, the difference, the threshold between whether a property crime is a misdemeanor and whether it's a felony is $900. Nine, a nine, if it's, uh, I think it's, if it's 900 or below or below 900, if it's but $900 or below, it would be a misdemeanor. In other words, you, you know, uh, uh, Larceny of nine hundred dollars or less would be a misdemeanor, whereas larceny of over nine hundred dollars would be a felony. The reason for that is that uh, the reason that nine hundred dollars is sort of odd number, as you might guess, it was a compromise between seven hundred fifty and a thousand. <laughs> the legislative study committee looked at probably a dozen years ago, and they spent some time in the interim trying to figure out how to how to uh, organize these property offenses and. Um, that was a compromise between those two numbers. That ended up being 900. So obviously, sort of an odd number, but um, in other cases, you'll see that it's not necessarily that 900 is threshold all the time, but it's pretty common. So, what the criminal code committee decided to do was to take an approach to say, okay, with many property offenses, they're going to uh, uh, connect the penalty to the amount of value of property involved. So you see in that list, you see is in, I'm in H579 right now. In the very beginning, we have a section that's going to go in the same group section we looked at the other uh, previously this morning, which is where all these classification provisions are found. And there's going to be proposal is to have one specifically for property offenses. So Zara, how is this tiered system going to work? You can see the value of the property is less than 100 bucks. It's going to be a class D misdemeanor. And if you remember, and if we can do a quick Find this uh, there we are. So class D misdemeanor, 30 days, $1,000 penalty. Want to see that? So um, that's if it's, uh, I think, $100 or less, right? Um, if it's, uh, if it involves, oh, the wrong one there. Um, um, if it's uh, less than a thousand dollars, but a hundred dollars or more, so somewhere between a hundred and nine ninety nine, say it's going to be a class C misdemeanor, which is uh, six months. Let me see that. So that's how this is work. They're tiered and connect. If it's a, where uh, we are, if it's. Less than ten thousand dollars, and equal to or greater than a thousand. So we moved up one more step between a thousand and ten thousand. It becomes a class A misdemeanor. Let me go back and see what that is. Class A misdemeanor is two years. Still a misdemeanor. Um, let's see, we're working our way up here. We've got two more, I think. So if it's a, if it's between. $100,000 and $10,000 becomes a felony. So it's going to go over there. Remember, the difference between misdemeanor and felony is two years. That remains the same. So it's obviously going to be over two years. Class D felony for an amount that's between $10,000 and $100,000. That is a five-year penalty, $50,000. And lastly, uh, if it is equal to or greater than $100,000, then it's a class C felony, which is 10 years. So that's the proposed setup. So a lot of times, or you'll see not every time, but a lot of times these property offenses, the penalty is going to depend on how much value was involved, how much was stolen, how much was counterfeit, how much was fraudulently obtained, 
Um, and you'll see, I, I don't know if there's any reason necessarily to go through this long list of offenses in this bill, especially given that you've only got a few minutes left, but just to give you a, a flavor of how this works. So here's an example. Um, section two of the bill shows you how this is done throughout the bill. So the crime is in place, uh, fraudulent use, you've intended to fraud, you've obtained or attempted to obtain money, property, services, or anything else of value by use of a credit card they know or should have known was stolen, forged, revoked, canceled, unauthorized. So you're obtaining property with a fake credit card, right? Um, now, the current penalty, it just happens to be in this case that there are two different statutes. So if you look at the next statute, what is the current penalty? Well, right now, it all depends on whether $500 is the uh, value that's used to distinguish the penalty. So right now, if it's, um, uh, sorry, I misspoke, the, that's the fine. Um, if the $50 is the threshold that uh, distinguishes what the penalty is. So if it's, uh, it's $50 or less that you used a fake credit card for, it's a six month uh, misdemeanor with a $500 fine. If I see that, that's on line six and four. If it's more than $50, then it's a one year misdemeanor with a $1,000 fine. Everybody see that? So that's the current status. Keep in mind, the maximum penalty there for this crime is what? One year, right? That's the maximum. Under the new proposal, this would be sentenced, this would be a sentence pursuant to what we just described, this threshold we described. So the maximum penalty goes up to 10 years. Everybody see that? Because now, if it was over $100,000, remember we just went through that whole tiering system based on the amount? If it's over $100,000, I'm not sure how many people do that with a credit card, but uh, if it were to happen, um, then you have a 10-year felony possible. I think if it was between $10,000 and $100,000, it would be five years. And if it were, uh, uh, and it goes all the way down. So now, it's also true, remember the minimum penalty right now under the existing law, even if it's less than 50 bucks, you get a six-month misdemeanor no matter what, right? But see that maximum six months? But, so under this new proposal, you can also have lesser penalties under certain circumstances. Because let's say it's less than 100 bucks. Remember, then that's a class D misdemeanor, which is only 30 days. See? So a smaller offense, smaller value used in the commission of the crime will get you a smaller penalty than under existing law, whereas a more value used in the crime could get could conceivably get you a greater penalty than under. <laughs> that's kind of an approach that's often reflected in the bill. So, so I think one of just uh, to help folks when they are run, walking mm -hmm. through this, if you get the actual report of the sentencing commission, there is a uh, table there that lists all the crimes and. On the side, it has notes, and it tells you if there's less time, more time, etc. It makes little notes there uh, on the side. So to follow along when we get more into right. this, I suggest also having that on hand. Yes, I had intended to do that. That's what I had sent to get posted, but it got lost in the shuffle somehow. So it's, it's not on the website currently, but I'll resend that to Mike. So could you show us another example where we don't go to that categorization scheme and just say, hey, this one's a class C misdemeanor, explain how, why that is the case on some of them? What about the unauthorized removal of books from the library? Yes, I saw that one too. That was, that was a good one. Uh, I thought there was one right here. Oh, yeah, I think it's counterfeiting paper money. Or no? It's not. Um, uh, page six. Although interesting, the thing I noticed this about the counterfeiting paper money offense. This thought was interesting. Line fifteen. It's a fourteen-year sentence what, under what, current law. What page is this? It's an odd one. Page five. Counterfeiting paper money, which I I was curious about. It's why I poked around in a little bit. It's been on the books in one form or another since the early nineteenth century. Um, and. Uh, for some reason, it has a 14-year penalty. Somewhat odd, but who know, whoever, whatever, then again, someone could say $900 is odd, too. We know why that happened, so these are all products of... Well, I think we should keep something like that, because if, if you're using paper money, shouldn't you be punished extra? It's a policy decision. <laughs> <laughs> That's an equity issue. Like if you, like if you just go, oh, I 
my guess it is that's true. So, <laughs> so here's know. here's an example of the one that you have mentioned that that, that, uh, that doesn't go to the tier system. Just essentially that uh, keeps it. So possession. This is use of credit card skimming devices. A relatively recent offense. This one has not been on the books since the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> credit card skimming devices are a more recent uh, uh, tool of unlawful activity. <laughs> um, the, uh, so right now, you see, if you knowingly and with the intent to defraud possess this one of these scanning devices, or, and I think if I remember this right, I remember when this was passed, and then something, it's like a you probably all know this better than I do, perhaps. But I don't. I don't. It's like a you, when you you put, use your credit card at a grocery store or something. That there's a, a device that somehow copies your credit card information in that exact moment mm -hmm. and can then skim your number off and you, then you know then your card can be used later. I think on. they're more common at a gas station. People yeah. have them specially made, and they'll actually be a, like a, a cone or or. or, or a carbon copy of, of the plastic piece that sticks yeah. out of yeah. the, the gas pump and it'll just clip right over the top of it. Huh. And then they come along later and pull it out and it's got right. your credit card info yeah. on it. Right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's those are some that's, of the more common ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, these are exactly, this statute is intended to address exactly that sort of situation yeah. and you can see when they got, when it got passed, um, in line six and seven, and lines fourteen and fifteen, it specifically is a ten-year felony you know, with a ten thousand-dollar fine to uh, to use or possess one of these things. So, the as far as the why, so I'm going to have to defer to the sentencing commission on this as to why it is that they chose particular offenses. But I can tell you the mechanics of what what is going on here. Then you see that it's different. It says in this case. If you do that, you commit a Class C felony. It does not have the language that we were just looking at, which most of these sections have, which is shall be sentenced pursuant to 52, 53, and 55. What that means is that they're going to be fit into that tiered system we just talked about. In other words, all depends on how much money was involved, right? In certain particular instances, there's, there's several of them in the bill, in particular property crimes, the Sentencing Commission chose not to go with that tiered system. It's the, the, I mean, the penalty that you get is based on how much money was involved. In other words, in this case, for example, how much money you skimmed using this credit card skimming device doesn't, doesn't vary based on how much money was involved. Instead, it says this is a 10-year felony all the time. This is what will always be a 10-year felony. And it's not going to be any less if you only used it for 100 bucks, and it's not going to be any more if you only used it for, if you used it for 100,000. So, um, there's a right. There are several several instances in the bill that you'll see where uh, the commission chose to keep the penalty as it was essentially and have it consistently be that way and not vary in the same sort of way. And I think probably it will be something that uh, when you hear from members of the sentencing commission, I suspect they'll probably talk you through those and let you know why it was in each instance they decided that it was better to go this route and to go with the classification. Does that make sense? Kind of a big picture of what's going on. With and then the rest of the, the bill is exactly that. With each offense, it either it either um, it either correlates it with this classification system based on the amount of money involved in the offense, or uh, uh, see, or it says, mm -hmm. well, in this particular case, let's see if I can find it. There, there's another one right there, for example. Or we'll decide to keep it as a as a. Uh, consistent penalty based on the conduct rather than have it vary based on the amount. I did notice that uh, this is just something I'm saying now, so we remember to ask, or maybe you already know the answer. For example, on I noticed that as I was looking up, as I was trying, I was thinking about the difference between passing a bad check and <coughs> false tokens. I think it's 2003. Uh, so 2003, here we are, false tokens. This is a, off, can be used for a bad check situation. Someone passes a bad check. Uh, but it has to be, you'll see it has to be on line six, it has to be intent to defraud. And there has to be also in line six, you have to obtain, you actually have to get the thing from the other person for the false check, for the bad check. 
Whereas under the bad check statute, 2022, doesn't have to, you don't have to have the intent to defraud. You just have to do it knowingly, and it doesn't matter whether you get anything back for it. You just pass the bad check. That's the penalty. Penalty's a lot less. Um, the thing that came up for me was how come bad why why bad checks isn't in the proposal? Kurt. Oh, bad checks is not in the proposal. Right. Yeah, it's not in the ch in the chart. Even. Oh well, we probably need to put that in there. I was wondering. It. Right. Possibly right. missed it. Yeah. Because I think this is one of the examples of why they are trying to rationalize this because they can charge often the same behavior with ten year, and I think bad checks is like one year. That's right. right. Exactly. And it's not that difference of behavior if, if at all. Right. And this is to try to like. To kind of restrict a little bit the discretion that prosecutors have, right? So it doesn't make a difference as far as the penalty. Yeah. So. Yeah, it makes sense. So one thing I don't think you uh, hit on that I think is going to be uh, pretty uh, important for our continued discussion on this is, uh, or or I. Zoned out when you hit on this, and I missed it. I probably is, <laughs> it is the uh, on page two, uh, lines nine to eleven. The each subsequent offense, the classification shall be increased by one class. Oh no, I did not mention that. Because that that right there is going to certainly be an area for discussion. I know that, for instance, the defenders are uh, not a fan of that concept, and that might hmm. be something that we're going to need to tinker with. Uh, the other thing that's possible is, is to decide whether <clears throat> whether we want to have a class uh, B and, or class D and C felonies for those levels, or if we want to go class E and, and D. But for subsequent offenses, you mean, or for just well, no, just for just for the uh, the tiered system. Oh, I see. Yep. And I expect that we'll hear from the ACLU on why we should go to that lower one with uh, lots of good data as far as. Let me say that. Uh, committee, we're going to have to yeah. stop now. I know there's some people left to get to the meeting. So. Thank you.